pale in comparison there. Um, but I love the topic of the body. And um, there is an interesting thing. I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the um, uncanny. And Freud's concept of this, which dates back to a, a story by E.T.A. Hoffman um, called The Sandman. And in it, actually, is featured an automaton. And it's kind of interesting, in a sense, because the automaton is this very compelling female figure that is, has almost these incredibly magical powers. And it's a bit like the dance we just saw, because, it had a, because there's this incredible precision associated with it, and this idea that that is somehow irresistible. Freud has, I, I unfortunately don't have time to talk in, in detail about this, but I encourage you to take a look at Freud's concept. And I also want to note that I think that the term uncanny is, uh, is, is a very flawed interpretation very flawed translation. I don't think it's possible to translate the uncanny accurately. But there is an element of this that actually provoke, that intersects with robotics, where we are, the, the idea is that at a certain point, robots can become a little too real for comfort. And the idea of the uncanny valley is that at a certain point, uh, there's a dip when robots are, start to become very, almost, they're familiar, but almost uncomfortably familiar. And we get repulsed by them. And then, um, and this has a lot to do with the design for the design of robots, too many implications of, of how it works. And I'm very interested by how this connects to our cultural consciousness and our cultural history. And it has, and very fundamentally, it has to do with our relationships with other bodies and with our own body. There's a lot of history of body art. Many artists have been working with their bodies in their, in their artwork. Um, Yoko Ono here, Chris Burden, and, and we could actually talk for an entire evening on that topic alone. Um, our particular, when it comes to intersection of technology and body and art, um, we, we have to um, acknowledge the great body artist, uh, Stella, who is an Australian performance artist, and uh, his work is fantastic, and he really engages with his body directly. There's also our home team of uh, survival research laboratories here in San Francisco to performances with machines that are very much embodiment, very much about the physical body. Not only about the machines that they make, but then also about the body of the, of the um, spectator. Because you're very aware of the sense of your own mortality when you watch a show. Those of you who have been there know what I mean. And another artist that I really like is uh, uh, Wafa Bilal who is an um, Iraqi artist who, in this particular case, put himself in a room and let people shoot at paintballs at him um, over a period of uh, a week or so. And it's really interesting about the idea of putting himself in the position of a target and then people online putting them in the position of um, um, sort of uh, uh, marksmen in some very twisted way. So I'll tell you about, just quickly about some of my projects. This is something called a telegarden which my students and I put together in 1995, the early days of the web, and we were very interested in the idea of the physicality of robots. And we decided to contrast the digital world of robotics with the natural world of a garden. And we put this uh, system online, we made an interface for it so anyone in the world could access it online. And um, people could move around by clicking on the screen to view the garden. They could also register and then they could water the garden and after they watered for a certain amount of time, they were allowed to plant the first seed. So the robot system here is a way of connecting in a certain way the physical, um, the physical body, uh, the physical aspect of nature, which I want to point out hasn't changed in 10,000 or 100,000 years. Our bodies are pretty much the same as they were um, from millennia, and uh, although technology has changed dramatically. One of the things that came out of this project was this, we started questioning this nature, the difference between, um, well, the fundamental question that came up was, is there a garden? And it became really an interesting meditation for me of what does it mean to have, um, to, to know something over a distance? And so I, I was reflecting on this distinction between virtual reality and distal reality, and um, that led to a book that I edited where we had third, sorry, eight artists, eight engineers, and eight um, philosophers talking about this idea of what we ended up calling telepistemology, which has to do with the, what is knowable at a distance. Again, which is related to this topic of embodiment. 
I mean, the follow-up to the Telegardener project was something we called the Teleactor, where we outfitted a human um, volunteer with um, microphones, and cameras, and network, network gear, so that she could walk around and essentially be um, a proxy for people online. So people could, not only just one person at a time, but many per people could see the world through her eyes as she walked around. And then, importantly, they could interact with her and the world through her experience. Around the same time, we became really interested in these experiments, the Stanley Milgram experiments, um, about um, experiments of uh, shocking people, the obedience to authority experiments from the 60s. And we wanted to see if there was something analogous on the web. So we built a system um, where you could do experiments. We called it a tele-robotic laboratory. You could do experiments with $200 bills. And you, when you registered, you were assigned one of the $100 bills. And then you were asked to do an experiment to determine which was real and which was counterfeit. So after you were assigned a sector of the bill, um, you were offered the opportunity to perform one of these experiments. And everyone, almost everyone, chose um, the thermal test, which was to burn a small hole in one of the bills and then um, examine the results. And after you selected that, you were then presented with a, a page that rem <laughs> yeah, reminded, reminded you that uh, that there's a federal law against this, and um, do you understand? Since we already had your email address, do you understand and was proceed? And that was a there was this moment of this sort of habeas corpus that we wanted you to hesitate and realize that you were about to commit, you know, essentially a federal crime that could be you could be imprisoned for clicking on the yes button. Um, almost everybody clicked yes, by the way. <laughs> this is a project that's uh, very recent that was in uh, the San Francisco uh, Contemporary. Um, Jewish Museum, and we were invited to do a piece there. Uh, this, this room is called the Yud. It's, uh, it's a very large room, about the size of this, where um, the art, Daniel Liebenskin designed it so that there would be no um, parallel walls and no um, uh, visual art. And so it's a challenge for an artist. Um, but we decided to do an, an art, an acoustic installation. And we used robotic cameras to observe people as they came into the gallery, and then we, we placed speakers <coughs> around the perimeter, and then directed the sound very locally to them, and they could localize the sound. So as they moved through the space, the sound would follow them. Again, it was an experiment in embodiment, in this case, in architecture, because we wanted people to be aware of the architecture in new ways. Oh. I'm going to skip this, because in the interest of time, I'm going to tell you this. Um, um, this project was something that uh, we, we got interested in. Again, I think of it in some way of, of aspect of embodiment because it was about our connection to the physical world, in this case, uh, the Earth. And um, this is a signal from um, a seismometer that's in the Hayward Fault in San Francisco, in, uh, outside, just underneath Berkeley. And um, so what we did was we made a website that had a very simple interface. We just took the signal and displayed it in this, uh, very, in this uh, stripped down, minimalist way. Um, and the idea was to be a reminder of the, the fact that the Earth is always in motion and that, in some sense, we're always vulnerable to it. After that project was um, released, I was approached by a, a composer who asked if um, it might be possible to sonify the sound. And so we started working together. This was Randall Packer, and we built this um, acoustic installation so people could walk inside <coughs> and experience the sound of the Earth. And he did a number of... Um, transformations that would take the sound and make it um, auditory, and then uh, people would experience it in the, um, often uh, in this position, um, because it would, the entire floor would resonate with the sounds of the, uh, the vibration and the, uh, these tones of the earth. And, and what was interesting is that it was never the same, like it was always um, changing because of the changing nature of the earth. And so that toured around in early, <coughs> um, um, around the country, and the uh, first few years of 2000s, and as we got closer to 2006, um, it was the anniversary of the 1906 earthquake, and I became interested in the idea of taking that, that, that sound installation and doing it um, in a theater-like space, so lots of people could experience it simultaneously. In particular, um, the idea was to, I was really interested in doing it as a performance. And so I met the, a dancer, um, Muriel Maffre, who was a principal dancer of the San Francisco Ballet, and um, I got up my courage to ask her if she would ever dance to the sound of the earth. 
And um, she said yes. So we started working together, and um, a year later, almost exactly to the day of the um, 1906 earthquake, we performed it on the San Francisco Opera House. I'm going to show you a small clip from that, um, but it's not the actual night of the performance because um, the ballet won't let me show that. But this is uh, uh, taped at the rehearsal, and it's illegal, so um, don't tell anyone. Besides. What's, what's interesting about this is that it is a pure improvisation, like the, the improvisation you just saw, but um, very different in the sense that there's no, there no rhythm. Uh, and uh, in fact, also to the degree that she had no idea the, 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 the sound was coming from the earth and that, at that live moment. And it takes a lot of guts, I have to say, for her, for Muriel's part, to get up on stage in front of her own audience. She was a favorite, she's a great, still is a favorite of the, uh, of the ballet audience. And uh, get up there and dance um, in front of 3,000 people to the sound that she had no idea exactly what was going to happen. Um, so since that project, we I've been interested in the idea. I've actually gotten a little bit older and a little less cynical, I might say. And um, I've been really interested in why the that that idea of the earth has to be um, kind of monochromatic and kind of grim. And I was thinking, why can't the Earth be more um, colorful and more exuberant? So I've been working with um, um, Martin Wachenberg and Francis, um, uh, Francesca Vietor, and um, we have come up with a new project that we're going to um, that's going to be at the Nevada Art Museum in February 15th. It's going to open up there and, and be on there on display there for four months, and <coughs> we call this Bloom. 
It's the same data, so it's the same, it's the same signal, so it's coming in uh, continuously from whatever fault. And then, in this case, it's generating these, uh, these uh, color field blooms um, that are triggered continuously. So what's interesting is that they also never, okay, I can't keep this on, although I'm not spinning around the stage at um, 2,000 RPM. Uh, um, and so this piece will be, it, what's, what's kind of also interesting is that it has this uh, ephemeral quality that you can't, um, that it will never repeat itself. And also that there's no way to preserve it. So after each display, I mean, after each bloom fades, it's, uh, it's gone forever. So we don't record it, <coughs> it gets projected on the screen, and then it goes away. With that, uh, I will.